you. Thanks so much, Jeff. All right. Good morning. Real quick, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know, I, I this is how you can find me. It's on my website. This is just my name, edwards3.com, and I've been uh, be asking people around the world on social media to pray for all of you that the, the graces you receive in this conference may bear fruit in your lives. But I want to just get a show of hands real quick. How many of you listen to podcasts? Any podcast people out there? All right, I want you to check out my podcast. It's called All Things Catholic. You can find it on Google Play or on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. And But I'm going to give you one warning, one very important warning. If you search my last name, SRI, on Apple Podcasts, you will find an Indian Hindu guru. And that's not me. <laughs> so you want to just make sure you find Edward SRI. That's that's where you would find me, Edward SRI. So you can check out my weekly podcast. It comes out every, every Tuesday. I'm going to go back to the previous slide right before real quick. And I'm going to tell you, this is what we're going to talk about today. So one slide backwards, please. We can go. Uh, I want to talk about my latest book and video project, which we just, uh, it was about a year ago. A year ago, this last week, I was in Jerusalem, and we were filming for this new documentary on Christ's passion. You know, as Catholics, we know all the stories about Jesus' passion. We know about his agonizing in the garden, his being betrayed by Judas, his being denied by Peter, carrying a cross, dying on Calvary. <laughs> but do we really understand all that's happening step by step in Jesus' life there and how everything he's doing is showing us how we're called to live each day? John Paul II once said that Christ's passion reveals the fullness of God's love for us. The fullness also of the great love we as human beings are called to. And so what we do in the series is we're there at the very places in Jerusalem where the passion unfolded. It was amazing. We got to go right to the Garden of Gethsemane and we're touching the ancient olive trees and we're touching the trees and saying the root systems of these very trees go all the way back to the time of Jesus. And so when we come to a place like this on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the story of Jesus becomes very real. And I've seen grown men who've been on pilgrimage with me, grown men in their 50s, 60s, 70s, break down in tears because they're realizing Jesus is real. He came right here on this mountain. He prayed. He sweat drops of blood right here, and he did it for me. And that's the experience of walking step by step through Jesus' life and being able to see what happened in his passion. And I want to give you a little taste of that today. You know, so this is certainly a great thing to think about at Lent, but I want us to remember what John Paul II said. Christ's passion reveals the fullness of God's love for us and the love that we're all called to live out. And that love is something that's not just for 40 days of Lent. That's for our entire lives, 24-7, in our marriages, in our families, in our communities, in the workplace. How do we live this amazing love that Christ shows us? That's what we're going to look at next. So with that, I'm going to have the slides that we can go just to the very beginning of the, of the PowerPoint, and we're going to start with a word of prayer here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for coming to take on our humanity to show us the way of love, and to offer your life as a sacrifice for our sins. We thank you that you show us what true love is really all about. We ask that you help us to live this love out. May your love transform our hearts in our marriages, in our families, in our parishes, that we may radiate your love, that every soul we come in contact with, Jesus, may look up and see not just us, but see you and your sacrificial, joyful love shining through us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You know, I have to tell you, when I was a kid growing up, I grew up in a wonderful Catholic school, a wonderful Catholic parish, and we, we'd had lots of devotion to Jesus and his passion. They did Stations of the Cross every Friday of Lent, and we did Stations of the Cross every first Friday of the month throughout the year. So there was a great devotion to the Stations of the Cross, a great devotion to Jesus' passion at our little Catholic school outside of Chicago. And I didn't realize what a blessing that was. I just assumed every Catholic school had this going on all around the country. But it was an incredible gift to me to have that as a young child growing up to reflect on Christ's passion regularly. But I have to tell you, as great as that experience was, and I really am so thankful for it, I even, if, if, with that background, still had... I think a misunderstanding 
about Jesus' passion. You see, if you would have asked me, why did Jesus die on the cross? What is the passion all about? I would have said something like what, what many Christians in America say is that, oh, Jesus is coming and taking on our punishment for us. And there's a, there's a certain truth to that, but I want you to know that perspective is not at the heart of a Catholic understanding of the cross. A Catholic understanding of the cross doesn't put punishment at the center, it puts love at the center. In fact, why do we call the passion the passion of the Christ? Well, the Latin word passio means suffering, so it does point to the suffering of Jesus, but as Pope Benedict highlighted, the passion of Jesus also takes on another level of meaning, that we could think about it as God's passionate love, driving God, who's just so passionately in love with us, to even come down, dwell among us, and, and die for our sins. It's love that drives him there. And I want you to think about it this way. You know, in, in the popular American understanding of the cross, we often think of it as, you know, have you ever heard like a, a Baptist preacher preach about this? You know, they'll say some, maybe something like, you know, well, the, the, the Father created humanity and, and in great love just made human, the human race to love him, but humanity rejected, rejected the Father. Adam and Eve, and then all the descendants of Adam and Eve, we have rejected the Father. And so we've been separated from God. And, and this loving God loves us so much that he even sent his own son to come down to earth. And, and uh, God was going to take this punishment in, that was meant to be given to all of us, and he's going uh, to throw it on his son instead. The son will step in, the innocent son, and say, Father, let me die for humanity. And the Son on Good Friday takes on the wrath of the Father so that we don't have to. And we're spared that punishment. That's how much God loves us. Have you ever heard Good Friday explained that way? That's not a Catholic understanding. That only gets a piece of the puzzle. Full Catholic understanding is about love. I mean, let's just think about it for a moment. Imagine if in the Sri household there was one, one little child and, and the child did something wrong. And, and, and there was, a, and, I, and that, that that child deserved to be punished. And so let's say he was going to get a spanking. And, and then all of a sudden the older brother came in and said, no, dad, don't spank my brother. Spank me instead. And I look at the innocent child. I look at the older brother. Or, or the, I look at the guilty child. Then I look at the innocent child. I look at the guilty one. I look at the innocent one. And I say, I don't care who I spank. I've just got to spank someone. And so I start spanking the innocent kid. How would that possibly solve the problem? And what does that make me look like? What would you think of a dad that was like that? Do we want to view God the Father that way? Listen to what Pope Benedict says. Pope Benedict says this, God is a lover with all the passion of a true love. And he goes on to explain that God's passionate love drives him to, to come down. Even though we've turned our backs from him, God is continuing to seek us out, to woo us back. And he comes and he even he enters into our human condition. And he comes and he enters into our, our state of being separated from God in order to, to unite us back to him. That by the Son being perfectly always united to the Father, by him coming to unite himself to sinful humanity, he unites us back to the Father. John Paul II once put it this way. What gives the cross its redemptive value is not the fact that an innocent person has suffered the punishment of the guilty. No, no, no. It's that, that God's love is what drove him to bring us back to the Father. Uh, the Catechism explains it this way. The Catechism explains that it's love to the end that gives the cross its redemptive value. It's love to the end. My favorite quote that I mention in the book is from St. Catherine of Siena. She once put it this way. She said, the nails could not have held Jesus there to the cross if love had not held him there first. So I want us to keep, look at the cross in this, this, this way that's very Catholic to see love at the very center. And what lessons can we learn about love from Jesus in his passion? So with that, are you ready? I want to go on pilgrimage with you. Do you want to come on pilgrimage? Do you want to go to the Holy Land? Let's go, let's go to Jerusalem right now, spiritually here. We're going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to take you into the Garden of Gethsemane. And I want you just to imagine being one of those apostles who's there that day. Imagine you're Peter or James or John, 
and you're there, and all of a sudden you see Jesus acting in a strange way. You've never seen him act like this before. All of a sudden you see him kneeling, he's prostrating, he's sweating like with drops of blood. This is intense. Did you know that in the Bible, we, there's never a time where we read about Jesus' posture in prayer? It never tells us about Jesus' posture in prayer except here in Gethsemane. And all of a sudden you see Jesus kneeling and then he just falls on his face. You're one of the apostles going, whoa, this is intense. And then Jesus turns to you in the midst of this and he says, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. And he's never talked about this before. He's been talking about some suffering that's coming in the future. But he's never opened up and shared about how that suffering was going to affect his soul. And this is the first time Jesus is just opening up, being very vulnerable with you. And saying, my soul is sorrowful even unto death. What does that expression mean? It describes someone being pushed to the limits of grief. Pushed to the limits of suffering. But what's most fascinating is that language that Jesus uses of his soul experiencing suffering unto death. That expression is found in the Old Testament to describe a particular kind of suffering. And it's perhaps one of the greatest griefs in human life. Greater than any physical pain someone may endure. It's when you have a friend, someone that you, you trust, someone that you love as a friend, and you find out he's turned on you. He's an enemy. Sirach chapter 37 verse 2 is the background. Sirach 37 verse 2 says this. Is it not a sorrow to the death when a friend is turned enemy? Think about what this means. When Jesus is there agonizing in the garden, what is he agonizing about? Is he agonizing about, oh, those nails are going to really hurt tomorrow? Oh, I really don't want those thorns in my head. Is he thinking about himself? I'm sure he's thinking about the pain and the suffering, but that's not what's primary here. Jesus is not primarily thinking about himself. He's thinking about who? Who's his friend that is turning to enemy right now as he's in Gethsemane praying? He's thinking about Judas. And he's feeling so sorrowful for Judas that Judas is about to turn on him. That Judas is about to betray him. I love this image of you're seeing Jesus' great love. Even in the midst of him being attacked, him not being treated well, he's thinking of the other. What do you do? When you feel like you're not being treated well, when you're not being appreciated, when your spouse says something or fails to do something and it hurts you, how do you respond in those moments? You tend to think, how come I'm not being treated better? You shouldn't say that. That's not fair, right? That's every bone of justice kind of comes up, you know, or every nerve of justice in us kind of just starts really, really, really coming out and shouting. But we want to be like Jesus and think of the other person. You know, maybe she said that because she's really having a rough day. Or maybe she doesn't realize what she's doing. Maybe there's something more going on there. Let's think about Jesus in Gethsemane. Uh, there's one other little lesson I want to take away from Jesus in Gethsemane. By the way, if we can go fast forward two, maybe just two, uh, two, two slides here. One more. There we go. So there we are. So we're, we're in the agony in the garden. I want to talk about this theme of Christ's total surrender. All right, we can, we can take it off there for a second. So let's... Uh, Think about this. Do you remember Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane? Do you remember when he says, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass? Have you ever wondered about that prayer? Do you ever wonder, why, why is Jesus praying? I remember as a kid going, is Jesus having second thoughts? <laughs> is he thinking of backing out at the last minute? You know, here's Jesus. He came to die for us. And at the last minute, he's like, oh, Father, is there another way? I want you to know what this prayer is really all about. So on one hand, this prayer is fully expressing how Jesus is human. He's truly human. And if he knows that he's about to be betrayed, he's about to be beaten and scourged and crucified, that's not something any ordinary human would look forward to. So he's truly human. If, you know, in other words, if Jesus was like, oh, I'm going to be betrayed? Cool, I love it when my friends turn on me. Oh, I'm going to get nails driven? Oh, awesome. How many of you have that on your bucket list? I just hope that that happens to me, right? right, right. Like, in other words, Jesus wouldn't be human if it was like that. So it's expressing his humanity. He's looking at all the pain and suffering. And as Thomas Aquinas says, his, in his human nature, this is repugnant to him as it would be for any human. But the difference between Jesus and us is this. Jesus is also fully divine. And so he remains perfectly united to the Father's will. So he can look at the suffering, acknowledge it. This is going to be really, really hard. And then he says, but I embrace this out of love. I embrace this because I love humanity, and I want to save it. 
Aquinas has a wonderful analogy about this. He says it's kind of like taking bad tasting medicine. Have you ever had to take bad tasting medicine? Just awful tasting medicine. You don't go, hey, let's have a party. Everyone come on over, watch the game and take some bad tasting medicine together. You know, like no one does that, right? But, but you don't take the bad tasting medicine for the taste. You take it because you know it could bring you health. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's not just doing this because of the pain. He's doing it because he knows it'll bring health to all of us. But have you ever tried to give one of your kids bad tasting medicine? Little Eleanor, my little three-year-old, last year she had a fever. And it, was, it went on for a couple days, so she needed some medicine. And this kid, she's our most willful child ever. Our Lord's really testing us in our old age here now. So, so little Eleanor, sweet little Eleanor, she does not want this medicine. And she's just like closing her mouth. She's pushing her hands away, you know, like this. And finally it took Beth and I both full on her. So I've got her legs. Beth's got her arms, you know. And then finally we got her pinned down. And then she does this. <laughs> she won't open her mouth. So I, I have to like let go really quick, open the mouth. We finally pour the medicine in. And what does she do? She spits it up all over our clothes, all over the furniture, the carpet, and she's just kicking and screaming. She doesn't want the med bad medicine, right? Well, I think the same is true with us, that we can be like little babies sometimes in our walk with God, that when we experience certain things that we know we just need to do this, but it's hard, I, I just need to forgive this person, or I just need to help this person, or I just need to say sorry, or I just need whatever it is. We sense God's asking us to do something, and many times we kick and we scream. We say, oh, I hope this doesn't happen. Do I have to do this? And, 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 and we were like a little baby Eleanor, like trying to resist God's will. What we want to do is be more like Jesus. Then when we see the events unfolding in our lives, and they may not be things that are pleasant, but can we see that maybe God is there, and there's some good that he wants to bring out of this, and I want to embrace it. That's a big theme in Christ's passion we're going to see as we move on. So I want to go to the next slide now. Actually, we're going to skip the next one. So persecution of truth, we talked about that yesterday in the whole conversation about is there truth. So I feel like I can just pass over that one. That Normally I would spend time on Pilate's conversation with Jesus. What is truth? And I talk about that. But we, we got to talk about that last night. So I want to take you on the road to Calvary now. I want to take you on the way of the cross. And do you remember when you did, you've done Stations of the Cross? Again, my experience, I remember those little prayer devotional books we had when we would do those Stations of the Cross. And it always came to this story of Simon carrying the cross of Jesus. And Simon was always held up as this wonderful example. He was a model of compassion. You know, Jesus was there suffering and Simon came and helped him. And Simon was such a great model of Christian service. And we should go and be like Simon to other people and help them carry their crosses in life. And as a little sixth grader, I could remember thinking, that doesn't make any sense. Why did I think that? You know, as a little sixth grader, I'm going, Simon didn't do this out of compassion. He was forced to do this. <laughs> Why is he such a model of compassion? I mean, think about it. Did Simon of Cyrene wake up that Friday morning and say, okay, Friday morning, prison ministry duty. I got to go find a prisoner. Who can I go help today? Is that what he did? Did Simon wake up that morning and think, how can I go help people today? How can I do service, a service project? No, he's just walking into the city like many others for the feast of Passover. And, and all of a sudden, he's forced by these Roman soldiers to take this guy's cross. I mean, which is a very shameful thing. This is an instrument of execution, and Simon has to carry it, and it's heavy, and, and he didn't want to do this. So Simon didn't do this out of compassion. He did it out of compulsion. So why is Simon such a great model for us? There's a little line in Luke's gospel I want to share with you, just one little tiny line that tells us a lot. So a little background here. Simon comes from North Africa. There's a Jewish population there in Cyrene in North Africa. And he's coming in with all the pilgrims. It says in Luke 23, 26, he's coming in from the countryside. He's coming in for Passover. And then when he carries the cross, Luke 23, 27 gives us just one little detail. One tiny little detail. It says this. That he carried the cross behind Jesus. He carried the cross behind behind Jesus. Why is that significant? Because what does Jesus say earlier in the gospel multiple times? If you want to be my disciple, what do you need to do? Pick up your cross and 
follow me. So multiple times he talks about to be a disciple is to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. What is Simon doing? He's picking up a cross and he's following Jesus. Exhibit A. In other words, Luke's gospel with this little detail subtly making a point. He's telling us something that the early Christians knew, and that was Simon of Cyrene had some kind of conversion. He had some kind of encounter with Jesus that turned his heart, and he became a disciple. In fact, there's some traditions that he became a very honorable family, that even the, the Gospels mention his two sons, Alexander and Rufus, and there's a Rufus mentioned in the end of Paul's letter to the Romans, who's most eminent in the Lord, and that would make sense. If, if your dad was the guy that carried the cross on Good Friday, you would be, your family would be most eminent in the Lord. So there's a lot of little details I don't have time to get into today, but there were early traditions about Simon was a noble Christian family. He had a conversion. And I think there's a powerful lesson for all of us to take away from this. And that is this. What do we do when we, like Simon, encounter the unexpected crosses that come up in life? What do we do when those unexpected crosses come our way? You see, it's easy when we plan our crosses. You know, like in Lent, we say, I'll give up chocolate. Or I'll give up this show. Or I'll do this extra thing. When we plan our little sacrifices, which is a good thing. It helps us develop our moral muscles when we can sacrifice more. So it's a wonderful thing to plan our little crosses in life. But the real area of growth, the real area of maturity as a Christian comes in the crosses we don't plan. The crosses we don't expect. When your car breaks down. When a kid breaks down. When your friend lets you down. When those things you weren't counting on all of a sudden just happened, like, oh, what, what, what's going on here, Lord? Why is this happening? I don't have time for this. Or when they're more serious things, like maybe when you experience a financial issue in your life and your world is turned upside down. Have you ever had moments like that where you're like, what, where, what, where are you, God, in the midst of this? Do you remember back in 2008, the big financial crisis? Many of us saw our 401ks quickly become 201ks. Remember that? That caused a lot, a lot of stress out there in the world. So it could be a financial thing. Or maybe it's like something at work with your job. Maybe like you have a boss, a new boss, or there's some new project put on your plate, a lot of pressure, and you're wondering, why is this happening? And you're worried about your future job and what's going to happen in your career. Maybe it's something going on with one of your kids. One of your kids you're a little worried about. You know, maybe they didn't turn out the way you hoped and you're just concerned and it's wearing you down. Or maybe there's some tension in your marriage and you know, your marriage used to be great. Now it's going through a really difficult time. And why, why is this happening, Lord? Where are you in the midst of this? What is going on? Maybe it's a health issue. Maybe there's some health issue you're facing or uh, the health of someone you love. When we have these things that come up in life, th th these little crosses that come up, what, what do we do with those unexpected crosses? Simon of Cyrene is going to tell us something very important. Is that those unexpected crosses are often the most beautiful turning points in our spiritual lives if we let them. I want to tell you about a, another great saint, Philip Neri. So when I do my pilgrimage to Rome, I always take people to the tomb of St. Philip Neri, and I love to tell them the story about Philip Neri, of what he said about those unexpected crosses. He once said this, don't run away from the crosses God sends you. Don't run away from the crosses God sends you, for you will only find a heavier one. I want to unpack what he means. But first of all, right now, I just want you just to pause. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to think about what is a little cross, an unexpected cross that you're facing right now. What's something that's burdening you in your life? Something you're afraid about? Something you're, 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 you're hurt by? Just, just, just think about what that is. And imagine Philip Neary, this great saint, looking at you and saying, don't run away from the crosses God sends you. For you will only find a heavier one. Now you can open your eyes. I want to tell you what he means by this. The crosses God sends you. Don't, don't, I don't want you to picture that as like Zeus throwing lightning bolts. God is like Zeus throwing crosses down at you. That's not what that means. In this world that's fallen because of original sin, there's going to be lots of suffering in this world. All of us are going to face suffering. No one's going to be able to run away from it. We're all going to face suffering. Some will have more than others, but we're all going to have suffering. God isn't throwing suffering on us. Suffering is a result of original sin. But... The God who loves us so much can even bring some good out of the sufferings that come our way. 
that God can actually help us carry those crosses. He can help us, support us, encourage us, and give us grace in the midst of those crosses that are really difficult. But it's more than that. He can actually work out a certain change in me. Like, I might not be able to control what's going on outside of my life. I might not be able to control my finances, my boss, my child, my marriage, this this health issue. I, I might not be able to control those things. But as a Christian, I should have faith and confidence that no matter what's happening out here, God can bring something good in here. That I can ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? What are you trying to show me? We have to see that the events that unfold in our life are profound ways that God is trying to teach us something all the time. It's not that he wants the suffering, but he can use it as a teaching moment to help us to grow. So maybe God's allowing me to experience this suffering so that I can just trust him more. Maybe God's allowing me to experience this difficulty because I'm used to having everything ordered. I'm, I, I'm very high controlling. I, I make a plan and a scheme and it all works. And now it's not working out and, and I'm not in control. And, and that's good for me. It's good for me to learn to rely more on God and not on my own planning and scheming and, and, and work and my own self-reliance. Or maybe God's allowing me to experience this suffering and, and this, these failures because I'm used to being successful and now things aren't going so well. And and, and I'm learning to grow in humility. That's good for me. Or maybe God's allowing me to experience this suffering so that I can have more compassion. A heart that's more compassionate on others who go through suffering. I might not be able to control what's happening out here, but God can always bring something good in here if we let him. If we see these unexpected crosses, not as random frustrating events, but as opportunities to encounter Jesus so that, that little thing that you said in your head just a few minutes ago that is burdening you, that little cross in your life, what you want to do is ask Jesus, Jesus, what are you, doing, what are you trying to teach me with this cross? What is, what is it that you're doing in my heart that you're trying to help me grow? Is it, do you want me to trust you more? Do you want me to surrender more? Do you want me to be more patient? Are you wanting to rely on you? What is it there? Because I, I want to respond to that. And know that if I run away from the cross, this cross that's right before me, and I run away from it, I'm just going to find other crosses because there's suffering everywhere. I'm going to find other crosses. The difference between this particular cross and the other crosses over here is that Jesus is right here. Jesus is here waiting. He's, he wants to embrace me, wants to help me with this cross. He's giving me grace to deal with this cross. And he's giving me grace that will bear much fruit in my life through this cross. But if I run away from it, I'm just going to find heavier crosses because they're heavier because those aren't the ones where Jesus is. So let's remember Simon of Cyrene. On that day, he did not volunteer for this. He didn't seek this out. It just happened. But through that time with Jesus, the greatest thing happened in his life. He found salvation. He became a disciple. He encountered Jesus' love, and it changed his life. And that same love can change us, if we dare, to meet Jesus in the unexpected crosses in our lives. Next slide. I want to talk about Jesus on the cross. I want to talk about forgiveness. This is one of the biggest lessons we can take away from Christ's passion. To think about forgiveness in our lives. Roman soldiers were used to hearing various cries when someone was crucified. As a man had the nails going through his hands. As he was being lifted up and starting to suffocate to death. They would hear cries of pain. They'd hear cries of anger. They'd hear cries of despair. But the last thing they ever expected to hear from a crucified criminal was these words. Forgive them. They know not what they do. That lesson of forgiveness, Jesus forgiving those very people who were crucifying him, is hard to imitate. You know, the catechism tells us about how we're called to forgive like Jesus forgives. But I want to do a similar exercise. I want you right now to think about someone who has hurt you. Someone who's hurt you deeply. It could be a long time ago from your childhood. Maybe a certain family member. A certain friend. Maybe it was someone in your young adult years. Maybe it's someone right now in your office or in your parish, in your family, in your own home. But I want you to think about someone that has deeply hurt you. It's hard to forgive this, some people, isn't it? Catechism 2843 says this. It's not always in our power not to feel a wound inflicted on us. 
So when that person comes into the room or I think about that person, immediately my, my, blood, my blood pressure goes up. I feel tense. And, and it's hard. I, 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 this person's hurt me deeply. I don't trust them. And I'm supposed to forgive them? The catechism recognizes, you know what? You may not be able to control your feelings towards someone else when you remember their hurt. But there are two things we can always do. There are two things we can always do for that person. And I want to talk about those two things. First of all, we can turn the hurt into intercession. We can turn the hurt into prayer. You see, we're not called to like everyone. Did you know that as a Christian, you don't have to like everyone? Like as a Cubs fan, I don't like the Cardinals. So that's, I, that's okay. But I am called to love the Cardinals. I've got dear friends that are Cardinals, and I love my, my brother Cardinal friends. Um, but we're not called to like everyone. What does like mean? Like is to feel attraction toward. It's to take pleasure in, to enjoy. You don't have to like everyone. You don't have to have delight in everyone. But we are called to love everyone. And let me give you your quiz again. Ready? What's the definition of love? To will the good of the other, right? To seek what's best for someone else. So I'm called to love everyone, even those people who've hurt me. I'm called to love them. Well, how do I love them? I'm not going to have warm, fuzzy feelings for them, but I can pray for them. In my will, I can say a prayer for them. Jesus, bless them. I, and I, I want to be clear. I'm not talking about Jesus. I pray that their wretched hearts will be converted. I'm not talking about that kind of a prayer. <laughs> I'm talking about really just praying for them. Jesus, may you bless them. May you bless their marriage, bless their career. May, may they grow in holiness. Jesus, I just, just, just praying for their good. Not getting into all their, but just, just you can actually will and pray for God's blessings upon them. You can offer sacrifices for them. That's a wonderful thing to do. I'm going to give up meat on Friday for this person that hurt me. That's turning your hurt into powerful prayer for the other person. You can offer Holy Communion. When you receive Holy Communion, do you know this? Every time you receive Communion, like when you come up today to receive Communion, you can offer your Communion for a particular intention. And one of the great things you can do, it's powerful, a powerful act of love, like Jesus on the cross, you can offer your Communion for those that hurt you. You see, these are acts of the will. They have nothing to do with feelings. And when you act against your feelings in this way, you become more and more Christ-like. And you find your feelings will start getting in a better, proper order. So if we notice the slightest hatred or resentment in our hearts, pray for that person. The smallest act of love can drive the demons of hatred, envy, and vengeance in your heart away. So those are small things we can do. So that's the first thing. Turn the hurt into intercession. Second thing we can do is we can have compassion on the person. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't say, hey, Father, forgive him. It's not a big deal. It's okay. No, don't worry about it. No, no, it was a really big deal. It was the biggest sin ever in the history of humanity to murder the Son of God. It was a really big deal. So Jesus doesn't sweep it under the rug, but he also doesn't say, Father, may your wrath come down and destroy these wretched people. That's not what he does. He says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And I think that's important for us to remember. They know not what they do. Many times... The people who are hurting us don't really realize what they're doing. That doesn't in any way excuse their bad actions, but it just puts it in a bigger perspective. We can notice the facts. This person did this wicked thing and it hurt me, but we may not know the whole truth. I remember years ago, back when I was just out of college, there was someone I came across that had a really, really rough kind of caustic personality. He claimed to be a really devout Catholic, really orthodox and all. But he just had this like edge to him. Like every time he was in there, he'd always put people down. He'd criticize, make fun of them. And then if you, if you looked like you were a little hurt by what he said, he'd be like, oh, come on, don't you know? I'm just, I'm just kidding along. Can't you take a joke? Which made you feel worse all the time. He was just really, he just didn't want to be around this guy. And I remember going to my spiritual director and I'm just like, I hate this guy. I hate being around him. What, you know, what and then he's just sitting there smiling. He goes, Ted, don't you see? He's so wounded. He's so hurt. Clearly he's acting out of some deep wound in his life. Can you see beyond, Ted, just the hurt that he's inflicting on you and realize there's some deep hurt in his own life? It doesn't excuse what he was doing at all. 
but it just helped me kind of think about it in a different way. And, 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 and sure enough, as I got to know and learn more of his story, he was from overseas, and his, his, his parents, uh, were, his, his father's business was all kind of falling apart. He came from a really super wealthy family overseas, and his family business came, uh, fall, came apart. His parents got a divorce, and his parents just didn't want to deal with the son anymore, so they sent him to America to study. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, if I grew up in an environment like that where my parents didn't love me and they just didn't care for me and everything was falling apart in my family, I might be jaded as well. I might do worse things than he was doing. And it just helped me see a little more beyond just the facts of what he did to me, but to see the whole story of his life. And, and so there's an expression that, that hurt people hurt people. I got to be careful. I once was teaching a class and I said that in class. And one of my students thought I was saying, Dr. Shree was encouraging us to hurt people, hurt people. I was like, no, no, no. I mean, people that are hurt tend to hurt others. And, and, and we have to just realize that many times when we have been inflicted by someone else, it may be because of some deep wound that they have gone through. So we have to be very careful that we don't fall into the trap of judging other people's hearts. We can always judge their actions as we talked about yesterday. This is wrong. You should not do this. But we don't know the whole story of what's going on in their lives. You know, I just think about, think about marriage. I just want to, I don't know if this happens to you all. You're just really good Catholic people spending a whole weekend at this conference. But married folks, can I just get a sense? Do you ever hurt each other? Does that ever happen in your marriage? <laughs> you know, all of the times when we hurt each other in marriage, it's not, it's oftentimes we don't realize what we're doing, right? We don't mean, you know, it's not like your spouse wakes up on Monday morning. How can I make my spouse miserable today? <laughs> you know, it's not like that. It's just like we, we get busy, we get distracted, or we, we lose our temper at a certain moment, or just not thinking, and, and something happens, and we hurt the one we love, and we feel badly about it. You know, so we want to remember that line from Jesus. You know, and, and I think this is like what, what my wife, Beth, she basically says, you know, almost every day, Father, forgive Ted. He never knows what he's doing. <laughs> But if you can have that perspective, instead of, why did you do that again? It's, you probably didn't realize what he was doing. Uh, that, that's, I'll say, this is what happened in, in my own marriage once. Well, I shouldn't say once, but many times. Uh, one of those tense moments, I was coming back from, I came back from work. This is very early on in our marriage, and we went to the store together. We had a little baby, just our, our firstborn, took the baby with us. And I said something on the way to the store. She took it the, not the way I intended and kind of said something back. I was like, why do you mean it that way? You know, it's just, do you ever have those tense moments like you're not clicking like you should? You know, and then we're at the grocery store and it's just still kind of like tense and we're driving home and I'm thinking, oh great, this is going to end up in one of those blow-ups tonight. And I'm just like, so I'm, she's over here and she's unloading, you know, the groceries and putting these cans up into a cabinet. I'm over here unloading groceries onto a table. And have you ever said something and as soon as you say it, you wish you didn't say it that way? You ever had that happen? Well, I had those words, and they came out of my mouth. And as soon as I said them to her, I was like, oh, no, can I get those words back? <laughs> but there they were floating into outer space toward her ears. So what should a good Catholic husband do as soon as he says something that he realizes he shouldn't say it that way to his wife? What should he do? I'll tell you what I did. I just turned around and kept unloading and hoped she didn't catch the nuance. Well, I knew she caught the nuance when there was a can about to go into the cabinet that just stopped in midair and came down back onto the counter. And she puts both hands on the counter and takes a di big, deep breath. Whew. And I'm over here going, oh, no, I'm dead. I'm in so much trouble here. <laughs> and then she looked over at me with a little smile. She said, you didn't mean to say it that way, did you? <laughs> and it was a beautiful moment. It was a beautiful moment for her to do that, right? Because when we're hurt, what do we tend to do? I want to fight back, right? I want to fight back. She could have yelled at me, like, why did you say that? You know, why did you have that tone? Why did you have to say it that way? She could have fought back, right? And what does that usually do for us as guys? Like when your wife does that, do you usually go, oh, yes, honey, I'm sorry, I was wrong. No, we tend to get more defensive when that happens, right? So that's usually not helpful. What's something worse she could have done? Yeah, she could have thrown the can at me. You're right. <laughs> But even worse than throwing the can, what could she have done? Silence. Oh, well, isn't silence the worst? She could have just gone like this. And just kept unloading. And I gotta say, hey honey, everything okay? And just keep unloading. She could have done that. 
But the fact that she kind of just came and she said, she called me on it, but in a way that wasn't judging my heart, that she could just say, you didn't mean it that way, did you? I mean, she probably had a sense that I already felt badly about what I was saying. And it was a beautiful moment because she did call me on it, but without kind of going in and judging my heart over it. And it gave me a chance to just say, oh, honey, I'm sorry. As soon as I said it, I shouldn't have said it that way. And that's what you want in those, those conflict moments, right? So we have in our marriage, we call it the marriage confessional, you know, where, I can, where, where you actually have to say it. You know, you, you have to say, I am sorry. And you name what you did. I'm, very, I'm sorry. And then the other person puts their hand over our, the other person's head and says, I absolve you. No, I'm just kidding. We don't do that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Well, but the other person has to say, I forgive you, right? Because what happens when, you know, sometimes you get someone like say, I'm sorry. And then the other person's like, oh, cool. I got him in sorry mode now. I'm going shopping. You know, it's gonna, <laughs> you know no, no, no. You have to like, bring resolution. I forgive you, right? That's where this beautiful line, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, applies in so many circumstances in life, in the workplace, in, in, in parish life, and family life, but most especially, I think, day to day in marriage, to see beyond the little, little, little tensions, little moments of friction. The person maybe didn't mean to inflict this pain on me. I'm not going to say it's okay, but I'm not going to judge their heart. Can we bring forgiveness? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. All right, last point. Last one I want to look at. So last slide. I want to take a look at Jesus on the cross, his absolute total trust. Do you remember those dark words on Good Friday when Jesus says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Remember those lines? What do those words really mean? Was Jesus really abandoned by his father on Good Friday? Was he rejected by the father at that moment? You know, that would be a crisis of the Trinity if that was the case. No, the son is always perfectly united to the father. But what is Jesus doing here? Jesus is quoting an oldie. He's quoting a famous song that everybody would have known in his day. Now, this song you're not going to find on iTunes. You know, you're going to find it in the book of Psalms in the Old Testament, Psalm 22. And that was a traditional rabbinic method where you would quote a line from the opening, one of the opening psalms, and then that would bring to mind the whole context of that psalm. And so... This, it would be kind of like today. If some of you asked me, oh, Dr. Shri, what, what music did you listen What bands did you listen to when you were growing up? And I just said to you something like, oh, I don't know, but it's a beautiful day. And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I'm going to keep talking like this with or without you. For those of you that know the rock band U2, you would know he's quoting lines from, from, from the, their famous songs, right? But if you didn't know that the, the band U2, you'd just think he's talking a bunch of gibberish right now. Or if you said to me, oh, Dr. Shree, what's, what's your you know, favorite movie or what's one of your favorite books? And I said, why did the ring come to me? Those of you that know what I'm referring to, I'm referring to Tolkien in that big moment when Frodo realizes the weight of the ring and he's saying this to Gandalf. It's a great moment. I'm talking about Lord of the Rings. But if you don't know Tolkien and Lord of the Rings, you're thinking, we have to pray for Dr. Shree's marriage. Oh, my goodness. He's, cr he's worried about the, his marriage or something. You know, like you're you're going to be confused. What we want to do is make sure we're looking at Jesus' words in the proper context. He's quoting an oldie, a song that everyone would know, Psalm 22. And it's a psalm about a righteous man that is experiencing great persecution and suffering. And he feels as if he's been abandoned by God. But as the psalm goes on, he talks about how he trusts the Lord. I'm going to read you a quote here from the psalm here. So he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from my, the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but find no rest. So he's feeling as if he's been abandoned by God. But then the very next words, he says, yet you alone are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted, they trusted, and you did deliver them. So this sound, doesn't sound like a man of despair. in despair. He's trusting that God is going to come and rescue him. Our fathers always turn to you in their moments of darkness, and you always help them. I trust you're going to do the same for me. So he's acknowledging, this is really hard, but I trust you, God. I place my confidence in you, just like our ancestors did. And the psalm goes on and gives a prophecy 
about the, how the, uh, a future righteous man is going to experience great suffering and darkness. He's going to be mocked by the people. People are going to pass by him and wag their heads at him in shame. He's going to be pierced in his hands and his feet. They're going to take his garments and divide his garments and cast lots for them. Does that sound familiar? It's a prophecy about what Jesus faces on Good Friday. And at the end of all of this suffering, the psalm concludes that all the ends of the earth shall worship the Lord. That all the nations are going to come and worship him. So what we see in Jesus on the cross is great confidence, total trust, total surrender into the Father's hands. And that's what he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When we experience those moments of darkness and uncertainty in life, we want to remember Jesus. Jesus acknowledged that it was hard. He, didn't, he wasn't just up there on the cross, oh, this is all fine, I know, I'm going to be raised on the third day. He, he's feeling the pain. He's feeling this intense darkness as if he's been abandoned by God. And yet he trusts like the ancestors in Israel did. He has total confidence that the Father will come and vindicate him and rescue him on the last day. And we as Christians need to have that, have that same kind of Christ-like confidence that in the midst of our trials and difficulties and burdens in life, God is there, can bring good about it, and he's, from it, and he's going, to, he's going to help us through it. So that's one of the great lessons we could take away from the cross. So with that, I'll, I'll turn to the last slide, I think, here. It's just simply the, is there one more? Yeah, okay, sorry, we're done. So basically, the, I just want to mention to you the, what I've been drawing from is the, the new book that I have, All on Christ's Passion. And it's all related to the video series that we did where we got to film in the Holy Land all about step-by-step step from Gethsemane to the cross, walking with Jesus in his passion. So if you want to get a visual to get a chance to see what Calvary looks like and what Gethsemane looks like and Pilate's house looks like, where all these events took place, you can check out the video series. They're running a great special. These are, I think, over almost 30% off at the table today. I know a lot of families are using this, a lot of men's and women's groups and Bible studies using it. And then the book, they're going to add this on to the special from last night. So the last night we had the special of the Who Am I to Judge in the Cymbalon book. For, so for both of them, only 15 For $5 more, you can also get this book as well, the, um, the No Greater Love. So please know, you are in my prayers. I'm going to pray that all the graces again from this conference, whether it's from the Mass or from the talks or your fellowship together, May, may really be sown deeply in your heart and may bear fruit in your life and in your family and your communities back home and your parishes at the end of this conference. I'm going to be with you for Mass and then I have to dart out right after Mass to catch my flight back to Denver. God willing, the blizzard doesn't keep me from home today. So here are my prayers. Let's do a glory be to end up here. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, and God bless. And I'm going to, oh, one last thing. <laughs> I'll, mention, I'll be at the book table. This is like the last little chance. I've had, there was a long line. People wanted me to sign books. I had to come in here. But I'm going to go straight back to the book table. I'll be there up until Mass. So we have about 25 minutes here before that. So thanks so much, and God bless you all.